today to have Dr. Joan um, Burkpile. Uh, she is going to be speaking on cosmic, I'm sorry, uh, coronal mass ejections. Dr. Burkpile, Dr. Burkpile is a project scientist at the High Altitude Observatory and manager of the Mauna Loa uh, Solar Observatory, which is part of the National Center for Atmospheric Research, better known in Boulder as NCAR. Uh, she got her PhD in physics from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Joan. Hi. Thank you. you have a oh, I got this. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, first, I, I apologize for those of you who came here thinking the world was going to end when CMEs hit. I, I didn't write the title. I, I, wrote, I wrote the mundane sort of physics-y stuff in the abstract. So um, I don't really think CMEs are the greatest threat to the planet. By the way, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. You can? Excellent. All right. I, um, but, but they do pose a hazard. And so I want to go through, and this is really a high-level talk. I'm going to talk about what is space weather. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the types of space weather and the impacts, show you some movies, except Clyde actually um, invited me. Dirk has actually figured out how to project this. But for some reason, some of the movies aren't playing. So I may run back and forth to the laptop, because I can play them outside of PowerPoint. Um, and I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm going to reach around you for the. Uh, Thank you. OK, so so what is space weather? Uh, you probably have heard of it. It's basically something that we've become aware of, in the, certainly since the space age. Because this, the biggest impact here is on technology and on people in outer space, and especially those outside of the magnetic environment of the Earth. But it's also a hazard to astronauts, even in low Earth orbit. So, it's really referring to the conditions in interplanetary space that are produced mostly by the sun. There are galactic cosmic rays as well that are a problem. Um, but, but most of it's from the sun. And these actually disrupt our technologies and affect human life and health. Not so much us on the ground, but it's, it's all about being in space. So the activity that I'm going to be talking about originates in the outer atmosphere of the sun called the corona. It's what you see when you go to a total eclipse. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the corona, and I apologize if this is a repeat of what you already know. Basically, though, this outer atmosphere is a million degrees. The surface of the sun is more like 5,000 degrees. So this is very, very hot. It's incredibly tenuous. 10 to the 9 particles per cubic centimeter sounds like a lot, but it's more than a billion times. Um, more tenuous than the air we're breathing. It's gigantic, let me just say that. You're seeing millions of miles across. And in fact, the corona expands to fill the heliosphere. So there's a continual solar wind that's produced by the sun, which is really the expanding corona. Uh, when you heat a gas, it expands, right? It, the bulk of the energy, because the density is so low, is in the magnetic field. And I'm going to come back to that over and over again. So the magnetic field in the corona is very important. It changes over the solar cycle. Down here, you have solar max. So you see these bright structures all around the sun. But here is just after solar minimum, and it looks very different. And the, the, the reason is the magnetic energy getting into the corona is, is much decreased around solar minimum when there are no sunspots. And it's at a maximum, at solar maximum. So you're going to have a lot more activity here. Now, the other thing about the corona is right here. The solar wind originates here that fills the uh, interplanetary space. These bright regions are where the magnetic field is helping gravity to hold that plasma down, because it wants to expand out and escape. The dark regions are where it's succeeding in getting out. And the magnetic field there is what we call open. In other words, it, it, it's going to possibly connect back to the sun, but it, it's way, way far away. So it, it connects, it closes so far away that in this environment, it's considered an open magnetic field, and the plasma just escapes right out of it. So, I, so th this activity originates in that corona. That's where it's all starting from. But the energy it's getting is coming from below. Now, I've grouped the types of space weather we observe into three categories. The first is the solar flares. So this is this sudden increase in brightness. Uh, particularly at the very short wavelengths. So the sun, most of the light it produces is in the optical. That's why we see in the optical. But uh, and on, and in the near infrared. So it produces only a little bit of light at the uh, very energetic wavelengths, like extreme ultraviolet and x-ray. 
But during a flare, particularly away from mat, uh, minimum, you can have a sudden increase of 100 to 1,000 times the amount of x-rays produced or even more that the, the sun produces at any given moment. So these flares um, are part of, uh, of space weather. Now, it's light, so it gets here in eight minutes. The sun is eight minutes away light in, in light time. So in, if you don't predict these things, when you, there's, if they happen, there's no predicting them. They, you know they're here because we've seen the photons and they've arrived. So you actually have to predict ahead of time when they're going to occur. That's relatively in its infancy. There's been a lot of progress. But it's a tricky thing to predict. You have to know when a flare is going to occur. This second category, these are the coronal mass ejections. These are these gigantic explosive events where part of this atmosphere literally gets ejected. So you have a background wind all the time. But in addition to that, you have this dynamic event that occurs where you have a sudden expulsion of the material and the embedded magnetic field that gets thrown out into interplanetary space. The magnetic storms, the geomagnetic storms, they can occur um, at Earth when they get hit by one of these things. There are certain conditions that have to exist I'll get into in a moment. But the most severe storms are always caused by mass ejections. There are some structures in the ambient wind that could cause them, but never severe. Those are more modest storms that just the ambient wind can cause. The last thing are energetic particles. And these are the same material. By the way, the sun is mostly helium. There's some, there's some excuse me, mostly hydrogen. There's some helium there and then trace amounts of things like iron and carbon, oxygen. Um, so most of the corona is hydrogen. So it's really, uh, it's, and it's a fully ionized plasma because it's a million degrees. That means the hydrogen atom, the proton, the electron are separated. So you just have free protons and free electrons just moving around in that atmosphere. And that's what the coronal mass ejection is made of. It's just mostly protons and electrons with small amounts of helium. Uh, but there's a magnetic field embedded. And this is a giant amount of material that, that moves out. It could take, as it can get here in as little as 16 or 17 hours. Typically, they take a couple of days to get here, depending on the speed. This is also. These are also the same particles. They're protons and electrons. The difference here, there is a lot fewer of them, but these are moving nearly relativistically. I mean, they're, really, they're moving close to the speed of light. Light gets here in eight minutes. These can get here in as little as 15. Some of them are moving that fast. Now, they're going to keep coming at us. They're produced by mass ejections and flares, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So these are basically the same types of material. This is a lot a smaller amount of it, but they have tremendous energies. So this is a movie I'm going to try to play, if I have any luck. I want to show you just an example of a solar flare. Let's see. Let's get out of there. Let me see if I can play it on my, my desktop with any luck. There we go. You, you may have to run it again for me. Okay. Just hit that start button. So, so these, are, these are active regions. This is where the magnetic field is stronger. And these very bright regions, these could be sunspots. Sunspots are locations of the strongest magnetic field. Sure. Is this a simulation or is this really Oh, that's a great question. My apologies. This is data. So this is the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory, and this is the AIA instrument. It's in low Earth orbit. Uh, this is actually a low resolution image. I'll show you some movies at higher resolution. It's looking at the sun in extreme ultraviolet light. That very short wavelength gets absorbed by our atmosphere. So our atmosphere and our magnetic field protect us from the bulk of this stuff. The atmosphere absorbs the extreme ultraviolet and x-ray. So if you want to observe anything in it, you have to go above the atmosphere. And that's where these images are taken. It's up there all the time. It takes images in a variety of wavelengths, all in, um, all in extreme ultraviolet, and they range in temperature, solar temperatures from 60,000 degrees up to about 4 million. So this is about 1.6 million. It's kind of an ambient coronal temperature. And it allows us to see, I mean, this is an incredibly dynamic sun. Things are happening all the time. And these brighter regions are where the field is stronger. There's a little ejection that happened over here. When it comes around again, you might see it. But you can see how this brightness is changing. Some of this are solar flares that are happening. You see the magnetic field is giving up its energy. You have a sudden brightness happening. So there's an increase in brightness. You'll see some of it happening here. So there's a transfer of energy from the magnetic field to the plasma. And it heats up, and it radiates at these short wavelengths. That's the flare. 
Thank you. Yes. Is this real speed or is that sped up? Oh, no, it is sped up. That's a good question. These images are taken about once a minute. Okay. So it doesn't happen quite that fast. I think it takes seven, about eight days. Uh, it's 27.4 as seen from Earth. Yeah, that's good information also. As seen from Earth, yeah, because we move. It really takes 25 days, but then we move. Um, the next one, I'm staying back here because it's another movie. <laughs> this is the coronal ja mass ejection movie. I, I appreciate you folks for being so patient with me. This one, for some reason, won't play. There we go. So here's what the mass ejection looks like. This is the physical ejection of the material. That data I showed you before, some of it is right here. So there's, there's the scale of that data we saw from the SDO. In, uh, right yes, right here. This is the mass ejection. This is data we can take from the ground at NCAR in Hawaii. You'll see it here. Now we've reduced our data to fit into this spatial scale. Can you see? Am I blocking you? Here's the ejection down here. You see it first in the ground-based observations, and then you see it in the space-based observations. This is uh, one of the oldest <laughs> instruments that's still functioning. It's not as old as Voyager. But this is the Lasko coronagraph. It's sitting on the SOHO spacecraft, which is a buoy for us. It's about a million miles closer to the sun than we are. And it's, it's in what's called a Lagrangian point, which is a stable gravitational location. So you don't need a lot of fuel to stay there. So it's sitting up ahead, looking for these things, and also measuring the solar wind. That information is fed back to space weather forecasters. Um, so, yes? This is probably very basic. When you look at the image of the sun, the, the sunspots are depressions. Yes, they are slightly depressed. And, and in fact, there are incredibly strong magnetic fields there. That's where the strongest fields are. So what they actually do is they're cooler. The reason they're dark is they're blocking the convective flow from below. So you have hotter gas welling up under, underneath the photosphere. And the magnetic field is so strong, those charged particles are, are forced to go someplace else. They're blocked. So the sunspots are actually cooler. Uh, on the, in the photosphere. Once you get up here, they're hot because now things have gotten out and yeah. But, but yes, we, we, the sunspots are carefully watched to see how complex they are. It's an indication of whether or not they're going to be uh, creating mass ejections. So I have a string of, of movies and then I'll, I'll hopefully stop running back and forth. Uh, <laughs> Okay, the next movie is the solar energetic particles. So you can't really image these. I don't think it's going to play. Yes. Okay, that's a winner. Um, here's that coronagraph again. Holy mackerel. Wow, okay. That was too good to be true. Uh, <laughs> oh, either that or I, did I hit a bad button? Maybe I hit a button. Okay, let me get out. This is one of the most disjoint talks I've ever given. I'm so sorry. We're a disjoint group. So <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're very kind. All right, I'm just going to stay there and not hit any buttons at all. Let's see if it jumps out again. That's that Lasko coronagraph again that we saw in the previous image where you saw that big white loop. Um, it, you really can't. I, the only way I can show you a picture of the particles is to show you their effect. So you'll see that suddenly this detector gets all this noise all over it. Those are the particles hitting this detector. So this is sitting a million miles upstream. There was a mass ejection here. Mostly it's coming toward us. And in less than 20 minutes, it hits this detector. And they just continue to come. So this, this is a buoy. It's to study space weather, and it's impacted by it. Um, they're able to clean off the detector. It takes a day or two. I mean, literally, you sort of discharge it. You keep sort of discharging it, and it'll eventually clean itself off. But, but those are what the particles, that's how quickly they get here. And that's just one of the impacts of them. OK. And now maybe I, I stop running back and forth for a moment. <laughs> um. That's interesting. Wow. This continues to be a challenge. OK, yes. Um, so these are the, this is a cartoon, obviously. I just wanted to make a, a point about the energetic particles. 
So here's the sun. And I said there's a magnetic field and a solar wind that can just is emanating from the sun all the time. That embedded solar wind, you can think of it as radial. So imagine you're, you have a, a, a sprinkler system, it's one of those things that rotates. When you first turn it on, the water just sprays out radially. And when you turn on the rotation, you get a spiral shape. Well, somebody was talking about the rotation of the sun. Because the sun rotates, it's actually rotating this way as we look at it, if that's the North Pole, you get a spiral. And this was first, uh, this was first uh, brought up theoretically by Eugene Parker in the 1950s. And lucky for him, just a few years later, not very far later, was the space age, and they actually did measure the solar wind. So he hypothesized there had to be a solar wind, and the shape of the magnetic field would be a spiral. And he was correct. The, thing, the reason I mention that, if you have an event that's happening here, like a flare or a mass ejection, that's creating these solar energetic particles that are moving at relativistic speeds, how do they get to us? These are charged particles. They need to follow the magnetic field line. There's something called a Lorentz force. It means that um, a particle, if it wants to move across a field line, it needs a lot of energy to do that. You can imagine a toboggan going down a, down a slope, but it has very high walls. So it's a high well. You need a lot of energy to get out of that. So you need energy to break away from that field, but it's very easy to travel along. So these particles pretty much travel along the field line. What that means, these field lines are going away from us. So energetic particles have a much harder time getting to us from the east limb. Believe it or not, this is the east limb. I'm used to it now. When I first started working, I didn't understand why. That was the east, and that's, when the, that's the west. But the sun's rotating that way. So you get used to it in solar physics. This is the east limb. And the particles have a harder time getting to us. But from sort of the central longitudes to the west limb is where we're more likely to get hit by these things. So this is one of those things, location. Location matters. So I, I mentioned before, solar activity originates in the corona. It gets its energy from the sun's magnetic field, which is not a surprise, because most of the energy in the corona is in the magnetic field. So that's why we, we keep caring about the magnetic field and wanting to understand it. This is just a, a model of what field lines could look like, because they're all over the sun. The sun is permeated with magnetic field. And then it brings us to how, how do CMEs even form? So there's magnetic field everywhere. Here are the sunspots that uh, somebody was asking about earlier and talking about. So this is where the field is strongest. The field comes up from below usually in sort of loop forms. And it, it's going to interact with the other fields that are there. So you have existing field. You have additional field coming up. We call this flux emergence. And when these things interact, um, it can be problematic. Because what's happening is you have a configuration that maybe was stable, maybe was in equi equilibrium. But it's now, getting, it's now getting readjusted by all this stuff coming up. And it's trying to find a stable stable configuration, something that it can, you know, not become unstable in. And, and plenty of times you get enough flux coming up, you wind up getting instabilities. Um, oh, that's a movie. I'm sorry. But, so there's two forms of instabilities I'm going to talk about. There are other ways to form mass ejections, but these are, these are some of the most common. So that is what's called a kink instability. What you're going to see at the very beginning is something that looks like a rope, like this. This is a model of it. And then suddenly it starts to come up. There's more flux coming below it, interacting with it. And all it needs to do is turn. Once it turns more than one and a half or two times, it's going to become kink unstable is what it's called. You can measure these in, um, in um, plasma, you know, like tokamak or something on the ground. So people study plasmas on the ground, and the sun is a great laboratory for that. And by the way, this bright stuff is flares. Oh, it's the, I hit the pointer. That was the pointer. When you wave it around in a circle, you see the Ah, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not qualified to use this. OK. I don't know if that was that. No, no. Either, I'm not qualified to use the pointer. <laughs> okay, I'm really testing your patience. 
Um, so that was the kink instability. That's one thing that can happen. You get these things called flux ropes that come up. Another thing that can happen is something called the toroidal instability. These things can work together, which is why I put this down here again. Here's this rope of material with new flux coming up. It starts to kink and it goes unstable. Now that alone can cause a CME if there's something else happening. This is an overlying field. So you can imagine a big loop of field over this, because this is coming up into field existing over it. If this field is strong enough, it will contain that eruption. It won't allow it to get out. If it's not strong enough, if it's weaker, if it's falling off, if the strength is falling off with height faster than this thing is, then it can become what's called a torus instability. And that's basically what this is saying here. It's basically saying that if the energy here is falling off more slowly with height than this overlying field, and it starts to go unstable, it's, it's not going to, this overlying field can't contain it. These are some old observations from the Solar Max mission. It's a, just a really nice example. Here's a flux rope down here. And what you're seeing is that's one of those just closed helmet streamers. But this flux rope is starting to get enough energy. It's pushing this up in height. And as it goes up in height, it weakens. And it gets too weak. It can't hold it anymore. And this becomes a mass ejection. Yeah? This may, I mean, not be a remark, but it seems that there's a, there's a lot of magnetic activity. Oh, there is. What is the source of the energy of magnetic activity? Well, that's a good question. The source of the energy, ultimately, for the sun is the, is the uh, nuclear furnace. So there's nuclear fusion at the core. Right. That's where the sun's getting its energy. So it, How does it translate Yeah, so uh, as you go away from the core, the sun is transporting outside of the core. It transports the energy up. It's what's called the radiative zone. It's the absorbing and uh, re-emitting of, of photons, and they go to longer they go to longer um, wavelengths. So you, you're sort of transferring energy that way. At the boundary there, just above that is the convective zone. Now you have um, motions and a lot of charged particles moving. So at that boundary, there's a shear layer, shear layer between the radiative and the convective zone. So when I have a shear, I have a shear, and I've got the sun rotating, and I've got charged particles, I, I have a lot of currents there. And so therefore, I'm forming a magnetic field. It's the dynamo. It's the really Earth, a transformer. It is. It, it is. It's a dynamo. It is. It's a dynamo. It's, this, it's similar, not exactly what's happening in the Earth, too. But in the Earth, you have liquid iron. So you have, you have uh, motion because of rotation. And you, have, and you have particles separated. So the minute you start moving particles, you have a current. You're going to generate a magnetic field. So it's a great question. So solar dynamo is what's producing the field. And the dynamo itself is ultimately produced from the energy in the core. Yeah. Sure. I'm afraid to push this button. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about the average properties, because we're going to get into the unaverage, the, the, the tail of the distribution, the real extreme ones. Just because I saw the title, I sort of added stuff about extreme events here, so you can find <laughs> out what those are like. So here's a typical CME. This is taken from the ground by NCAR. These are about, on average, 50 degrees wide. That's sort of typical, your average run of the mill. Average run of the mill is 450 to 500 kilometers a second. That's more than a half a million miles an hour, but that's average. Um, that's, that's not much faster than the, so the slow solar wind. The fast solar wind is faster. So this is a little faster than the slow solar wind. A mass, 5 times 10 to the 15 grams, which sounds like a lot. But that's maybe only 5% of the mass of the corona. And there's continual material coming up, welling up anyway, from below. Mechanical energy is 10 to the 31 ergs. Um, of course, the big ones are wider, faster, more massive, and they have a lot more energy. And then the rates over the cycle, and it depends on who, who tells you. These are going to vary a little bit depending on who's doing the cataloging. Um, four to five per day, solar minimum less than one per day and they have lower energy. Sometimes when there's nothing happening, so you're looking for stuff like this when it's active. And maybe there's a little jet going off over here, but you don't care because you have something fun to catalog. So then what happens is when it's boring and it's solar minimum and you don't have anything fun that day, you start counting the jets. So you have to be a little careful. I'm always very careful to try to figure out what the heck these catalogs are telling me because suddenly you find a whole bunch of it's only three degrees wide, and there's six of them that day. Does that mean there were six mass ejections? Yeah, well, 
Think everything's subjective, right? Now this is a great movie. I just wanted to show you a fun movie from NASA that just shows you, this is the AIA data again we saw earlier. Um, I might have to jump out and try to play this too. It's just a real nice movie of the high, more high resolution of from AIA. Let's see if it'll let me play. Yes. The sound is NASA. There's not usually sound in space. But this is NASA produced. Um, so this is that, this is that uh, instrument again. This is data. And this is the kind of resolution you can get out of this data. It's, fan it's fantastic. And it's showing you this is actually cooler material this is ionized helium. It's about 60 to 80,000 degrees. This is one of those spectacular prominence eruptions. That's a flux rope erupting. Now, you'll see most of this material fall back, but overlying it that you can't see because this stuff is hot and that line doesn't see it. That line sees 60 to 80,000. This is looking at one to two million. If you want to see these loops, you have to look at the hotter lines, but you want to put it all together. So you want to observe it a whole bunch of different um, temperatures and heights to try to put together a more complete piece. And, and you'll see this, is this the one that ejects? I lost track here. You'll see an ejection, that's that one again, it's just circling around. Here comes the pro uh, filament eruption, prominence eruption, same thing. The bright stuff um, on, in the extreme ultraviolet is, is some flaring material as well. But this is just the kind of data you can get every day. You can download this. That is a CME. And here's an aftermath of a flare. And there goes another one. By the way, this data is all available online for anybody. How much is it speeded up over time? They have sped this up. My guess is this is probably um, um, a minute. I, I'm not quite sure. Maybe they have a minute. But they're showing it at like 30 times or 50 times the speed. I apologize. I don't know exactly because I just downloaded the movie as is. Yeah, but, but this is available online. You guys can download this kind of stuff. So for perspective, yeah. this one, how high off the surface of that is it going to space? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so this is, well, this is the corona, so that's pretty high up. Although this line, you can see here, this surface is, you're, you're above the photosphere, not by a whole lot. This, this here is the, this is just above the, just above the chromosphere. The chromosphere is maybe 4,000 kilometers, something like that, 5,000 kilometers. Depends on the conditions. It's in pressure balance, so it varies a little bit depending on where you are. And then, so this, these things are erupting. I mean, here's a solar radius, which is um, 695,000 kilometers. So this could be 400,000 kilometers. Yeah. And, and it's still gravitationally bound. A lot of that stuff, it's very dense plasma. That stuff is, those prominences are more dense, so they're more likely to come back if they don't have enough of a kick. Let's see. Okay. Let's see what I've got next. That was that. Okay, so three types. And you said the density was like 10 to the ninth particles. Yeah. Region. Oh, in the that's corona. The, that's without the flare. Well, how about yeah, that, that's the corona. What's Typical. The density, what's the density in the flare? Oh, the flares are, are the light, so they really don't have a density. They have an energy density. Those are just photons. But those prominences are more dense. Those could be 10 to the, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 grams. Okay. They're, they're much denser, much more dense. They're cooler. You know, that material you were seeing is it's like 60, 80,000 degrees, where the stuff up in the corona is in one to two million. Yeah. So why do, we, why do we care? So what are the impacts? I just thought I'd show you and start talking about the impacts in space weather. So this is what the flares do. So these are, I don't know if you can read that okay, but um, the, the flares really produce communication problems. You're going to find out all these things communi have produced communication problems. So again, we said this earlier, they get to the Earth in eight minutes. They're modifying the Earth's upper atmosphere. So above the stratosphere, there's something called the thermosphere and ionosphere. It's, 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 it's ionized at a very small percentage, a few percent. But that makes all the difference in the world. Because having plasma up there, for instance, allows you to bounce radio waves off. And, you know, and especially at certain frequencies. And you can kind of figure out, you know, that's what I invented. If there's nothing going on up there, you can determine exactly how well your radio is going to, how you have to tune it, you know, what you expect to hear, how much, 
you know, noise you're going to have. This disrupts all that. This dumps energy in and inflates the amount of plasma. So now you have a lot more free electrons up there. And it turns out, especially for high frequency communication, they're most impacted. They, they depend on um, how, how that signal bounces, where it bounces, how much of it bounces, depends on that, how many free electrons are up there. And when you change that, suddenly the signal may bounce and come someplace entirely different. During a storm, people have reported they couldn't get local stations, but they could hear stuff halfway around the world. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly, it's bouncing and coming in a completely different place. Other times, it doesn't work at all, because now the thing it doesn't bounce at all. It just goes right through certain frequencies. Or they're completely absorbed. So this is a real problem. And you're going to see it happening. When I talk about this, that's exactly what's happening here when we talk about communication. Also, your GPS is not so accurate anymore. And for us, that's not so much of a big deal. But for people who are doing precision GPS, somebody drilling or, you know, the Air Force, <laughs> or if you're in a plane that's landing GPS in a fog, um, that kind of matters. Because the GPS depends on, it, it thinks it knows where that signal is bouncing from. And if the ionosphere is changing the path, then, the, then there's an inaccuracy in your GPS. And that's well, yes? GPS is really used bounced signals. Well, the, you're talking to that satellite. The satellite knows where it is, right? Because it's got star trackers on it. But it has to tell you where it is, right? I just thought it was a direct signal. I didn't think they bounced. Well, there's a say. I just mean from us. The signal we're getting from them is changed. There's a triangulation, and there's a. How, how do we get that information? On your, for, for instance, we have GPS on our phones. It's going through the atmosphere. We're communicating signals, right? That are coming down from a satellite. But isn't it straight line? It's a, it's a plasma, though, right? Yes. It's a plasma, and a plasma looks like a metal. All the yeah. electrons can go around, and so it actually starts to shield it. Yeah. And she's much too sanguine, in my viewpoint, because all the ATMs rely on uh, timing from uh, GPS satellites for their clocks. Oh, do they? Okay. Lots of different things yeah. to do So is it, is it simply a matter that the, the signals are blocked? Yes. Some of them are. Yes. It's very similar when the Apollo came in. You get plasma around the backside. Yeah and you couldn't uh, communicate with them. Yeah, so this can go, it can, it can either disrupt it, completely bring it down, attenuate it. Um, so it's a problem. And the same thing here, these are the solar energetic particles. They're also referred to as radio storm, or radiation storms. And by the way, um, the, the Space Weather Prediction Center is right in Boulder. You can go into NOAA. Well, you have to get through security now. But you can, you can get in and get a tour. But you do have to go through security. Um, and, and, and that's where this, for the country, that's the Space Weather Prediction Center location. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so, so these are now the energetic particles. Now, in addition to the same problems, they're going to um, bring the same problems with them for communication. There's some other real problems. These are now very energetic protons. This is not light. This is protons and electrons. And, and you don't want to be up there, in a, for instance, on an EVA, um, outside of the, you know, the space station or the shuttle. It's a very bad place to be. Um, so you have to get inside the space station. And if, and if NOAA thinks it's a really strong storm, they're going to tell you to get into the most protected parts of the space station. Um, this is uh, the biggest problem that NASA faces, sending people to Mars, because that's a two-year trip. And now you have really only the protection that they can somehow build into that spacecraft. And the same on the surface of the moon. Once you get to the moon, you're outside of the Earth's magnetic field for the most part. Sometimes it's going through our tail of, the tail of our field. But you, you have the same problem. But at least you're only four days away, not, not a two-year round trip. Aircraft crews, if they're flying at high altitude like the military does, or they're doing a polar orbit, because remember I said particles like to follow the field in? The particles that come from the solar wind, if they get in here, most of them come down into the polar regions but they can be distributed. Um, this is why the aurora are mostly at the poles. But when you have a very strong storm, it'll drive those particles into the lower latitudes. So um, potential problem for aircraft crews. And it knocks out satellites. Now, the, these are the mass ejections when they hit. So these are the giant, I hate to say lumbering, because some of them are moving at 6 million. The big ones, fast ones, are 6 million miles an hour. But when they get here, 
they have a lot more material and kinetic energy they can transfer if they can get in here. And in addition to those po problems we already mentioned, they can actually, it's big ones, the big ones, actually change the magnetic field of the Earth so much, like ringing a bell, they drive ground currents. So now you can drive all these ground currents that can actually knock out power grids, especially at higher latitudes. They're more susceptible. And uh, the good side of all this is the aurora. It's always beautiful aurora. Um, OK, I just want to show <laughs> I have a couple more movies than I'm Stop running back here. How am I doing on time? OK, and then we're going to get into the extreme events. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's this one. OK. That's as loud as it gets. Whoa, what happened? Here. Here, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this and, and then come back. So what you're seeing here, if you don't mind me talking from back here, here's the stereo spacecraft. This was uh, the first mission um, that they, they put, put two spacecraft outside of the Sun-Earth line. This way we can triangulate these events better. So here's us, there's the Sun. Stereo actually had two spacecrafts that flew around the distance of, from the Sun that the Earth is, about a million, through 93 million miles. But they went around, and they went around the back of the Sun. So they could take images from different directions and we could triangulate a lot better. And the people at the Space Weather Prediction said, um, having that data really improved their forecasts. Let's just keep going. Just to want to show you the massive, this is, this is to show you how big CMEs are. They're, they just keep, they expand to become gigantic in interplanetary space. So here, if I can just freeze for a moment, this image here, this is the Lasco coronagraph, the wide view coronagraph. The edge of that field of view is not too far from the orbit of Mercury, not too far. Here comes this giant CME, and this data, the black and white, that was the first time we have ever had something called a heliospheric imager. It's actually a fish eye lens that allowed them to track CMEs almost from the sun to the earth in this giant fish eye configuration. Just to show you the sheer size of these things. They really are gigantic. So this is all data, by the way, except some of it's color-coded. And here's to show you how they transfer the energy. So now you're going to see a cartoon of a CME coming off and hitting the Earth. And I'm going to pause it because there's something about that cloud that's going to determine how severe this storm is. Here's our magnetic field protecting us, our shield. And what happens is our field right now points upward. So our magnetic field is pointing in this direction at the bow shock here, and then it goes back into the North Pole. If this cloud of gas contains magnetic field that's pointing southward, something called magnetic reconnection can happen. And those two field lines can connect. This is a, a well-known process. They see it in the lab. And throughout the universe, we think magnetic reconnection is happening. By the way, that's what's, that's what's happening when you get a flare. Magnetic reconnection happens. You transfer energy from the field to the plasma and heat it up. When this happens and these connect, and most of the connection is going to happen back here, you can take the particles on, in this cloud and dump them on our field lines. It's like a train on a track. Here's the solar wind track, and here's the Earth's magnetic field. And if magnetic reconnection happens, now the particles that were on that solar wind field line are now on ours. So not only the kinetic energy of this cloud, but the direction of the field. That's what I was talking about in one of the earlier slides. That's how it determines how much of that stuff's going to get in. So that's trouble when the field's going south. And you're going to see what happens here. In this cartoon, the field's going south. You're going to see the field in the tail get compressed. And that point is the reconnection point. And here come the particles. They come spiraling in. Obviously, this is sped up. You get, you get aurora. And now here's a data. Here's data of the CMEs themselves from LASCO. This is what happens at maximum. You can get quite a few. These are the Halloween storms I'm going to mention in a little while. There's a solar energetic particle event. This is to show you how big these things get in orbit. Those are the two stereo spacecraft. 
That's at the Earth orbit, that red line and the blue line. Just they're, they're not along the Earth-Sun line. And when those things actually uh, erupt, they, they're absolutely mammoth. This is to show you the data put together, but now they're going to scale it down. So these are not on the same scale. You see how big the solar disk is compared to the Earth. But in this configuration, so the stuff on the right is, is actually much smaller scale than the stuff on the left. But you can actually image these clouds almost right out to the orbit of the Earth. That's data that you're seeing from stereo. It's really remarkable. Can we see this activity on other stars? That's a great question. Um, it's been hypothesized, but right now people have talked about giant flares, but um, I don't think anyone's seen a mass ejection from another star. It's coming, though. So this is just to show you the scale. These clouds go out all the way to the end of the heliosphere. They become even more tenuous, but they're really gigantic. OK. Back to this. Keep jumping around. OK. I'm actually going to come. Do you want to see one, one of the last movies? I feel bad not showing you. They're really great movies. So here's another one from NASA. And this is actually going to show you the same kind of a thing. But what I like about this movie is that, um, where is it? Where is that movie? That's odd. Sorry, is, is there any question? Um, oh, here it is. These effects would not happen in another uh, Is there any? Oh, no, no, they would. Yep. Um, not every star, not every star, but um, there's a lot of stars that have activity cycles, and we know that. Uh, and not from being able to detect the mass ejections, but what we see in the chromosphere, the, the, the signals we see, you can see those on other stars, but more like one measurement. So you don't know where it is on the star necessarily. But we know from those measurements um, the kind of light that's produced in the chromosphere from the presence of active regions is, is trackable on other stars. So we know not all stars, not all stars. Older stars um, eventually don't have enough energy or they spin down and eventually they don't have a magnetic field anymore. That, that can happen. And so not all stars have, have stellar cycles. But it's a good question. So this is to show you again, but just a different look. Here's those magnetic field lines again. But this I like because instead of the field, you're seeing the particles. This is the environment we live in. And there's our magnetic shield. You can't really see it, but that's what it's doing for us. It's, it's remarkable. Thank goodness for a magnetic field. It's one of the reasons Mars is not the place, it's not there's no protection. It's lost its magnetic field. It's pretty much lost its atmosphere. It's very, very tenuous. There's that reconnection again. If you lose your magnetic field, which Mars has really done, there's reconnection. It's just to show you, and there's just the cloud. This is sort of a hodgepodge of stuff. If you lose your magnetic field, um, then you have the solar wind hitting your atmosphere. And that's what happened to Mars. And when it, when it hits the atmosphere, it'll actually ionize part of it. So this is spaghetti. That's the magnetic field of the Earth. So the magnetic field is helical? Um, the particles move in helical paths. Okay, That's so what it's trying to show you. It's, it's to show you where the field is, but the particle trajectories are helical. That's a really good question. So it's, it's telling you where the field is, but the field doesn't have that ribbon shape. But the particles do that. They spiral. Yeah. Um, but that's one of the reasons Mars has lost so much of its atmosphere. The solar wind hits it. And it's, it's ionized it. And so once it's charged, then it carries it away with the magnetic field in the, in the solar wind. So the idea is silly. Well, it's not silly, but um, it's harsh. <laughs> it, it, like I said, you, you have to burrow under. Um, there's no protection. OK, we just saw that one. All right, so back to this. Um, extreme. So let, let's get to the extreme stuff. <laughs> Those were just typical, right? That's the background. Um, so there's kind of how, how, do, how do we measure these things, right? So I'm going to break it up into the, forget the flares for the moment. I'm going to break it up into the geomagnetic storms, those are the mass ejections, and the solar energetic particles. So I'm going to show you those two things that we at least can sort of have a beginning catalog of what, how many severe events occurred. But how do we determine that? 
Well, what are we going to look for? We have to figure out, did we see any technology and human impacts? All right, we need, we need data. Um, are there any kind of observations that quantify how severe the storms are? So that's really what people have done, not me. People have done this and gone into the record to try to figure out how do we determine if one of these things occurred, either a CME or the, a solar energetic particle event. And remember, these produce these. Let's start with the CMEs, the geomagnetic storms. So what data do we have? Um, if we're at the Earth, one thing we would know, we know they ring the big ones, especially even the moderate ones, sort of change the magnetic field of the Earth. They kind of ring it like a bell. And the big ones are going to really ring it like a bell. So the first thing you want to look at, were there any big changes in the Earth's magnetic field? Well, we know that happened in 1859 for the first time because just a few decades before that, uh, scientists had begun using magnetometers. So there were some, not many, magnetometers on the ground. And when that event occurred, there were sparse measurements, but they could see dramatic changes. You know, normally we're just sort of looking at a little change. Suddenly things went wild. And so it was, we know there was a huge change in the magnetic field. Something else that people, people themselves recorded were auroral sightings at very low latitudes. And this underestimates really what the, what the um, historic record shows. They were seen in Cuba. They were seen in uh, Mexico. The aurora at higher latitude, I mean, we're talking like New York or California. The aurora was so bright, people thought it was, the sun had come up and it was a cloudy day. People had gotten up. People were reading outside. This is before electric lights. So this was startling how bright the aurora were. They were incredibly bright. And were there technology impacts? There were. I'm going to show you that on the next slide, what they were. So this is the biggest event we know of, and I'm going to show you on the next slide, in what we call the observational error of, um, for geomagnetic storms. It, it's really tough to tell before this what happened, um, at least in terms of the mass ejection hitting us. What, what, it, what happened to the magnetic field? Um, so the modern error, which you really start to be able to put together a more detailed picture of what happened. Well, we have solar wind observations starting in the early 60s, because here you can actually measure the thing in space. Right? So the first thing, the first observation was 1962, Mariner 2, on its way to Mercury, actually had some detectors on it so it could measure some solar wind properties like the plasma, the magnetic field. It actually detected a shock on its way in the solar wind, which we later knew was a CME shock. People suspected it at the time, but as you get more observations, you can confirm it. And then from the ground, did you, who, who actually saw anything about a CME? In 1971, from the ground, this was an NCAR instrument, um, they reported a transient, is what they were called back then. And a year later, from space, there was the first coronagraph picture of a CME. Now, we see tons of them now. You've seen LASCO images, uh, so there's lots of them. But those were the first. So using that information, what changes were there in the magnetic field, auroral sightings, and then space-based observations? I've only put up the biggest four. There are others, of course, but I'm just showing you the big four. This is still the biggest we know of. Now remember, we don't have, this, is, this DST index is actually a measure of the changes in the magnetic fields of energy of the Earth. Negative means the Earth's magnetic energy actually lowered. Something happened, there were ground currents. You can have like a back EMF, it's going to reduce like a, a field strength, right? So that's what happened here. And negative is when you know it's really bad. This is the southward pointing field that comes in and dumps all the energy. So when you see a, a negative DST, that's trouble. And these are huge numbers. This was estimated from models and the sparse data they had from the magnetometers by Ed Cliver. He's a very um, careful person. He also estimated this second biggest storm we know of. This is 1921. I'm going to tell you the impacts on the next slide. These are estimated as well, so almost as big as the Carrington. Not quite. There were problems with this storm, too. Keep in mind, um, we'll, we'll talk about it in the next slide. What's the technology impact here? Here's the biggest storm in the space age, 1989. This is actually measured now. So now we have the data. So maybe not a little more than half as big as the 1859 storm. And then now here are the Halloween storms. 
We actually, there were three fast CMEs. This was the strongest. And that's a problem, too. I'll, make, I'll get to that in a moment. There's a, this is actually a painting of the Aurora from 1859 by somebody who saw it at the time. So what happened? I'm sorry this is so busy, but I wanted you to be able to read it. I've sort of tried to color code. Here are the four big storms. 1859, this was the first space weather event because there's technology impacted. The telegraph systems in the US and Europe actually went offline because there's voltage increases in, from the ground currents. No one was killed, but some of the operators were shocked and the poles went on fire. And I already mentioned the Aurora. So we were very lucky that the biggest storm we know of, you know, in the last 150 years, happened when we had very minimal technology. Here's the next one. This is actually, happens to be also in the, it's in time order, but it also happens to be in the order of the strength. 1921, we still don't have a lot of massive communication technology. We really don't. We're, even though we have it, it's, we're not so connected as like giant power grid systems everywhere. So there was stuff, but um, so this, this big storm happened before we had even more technology that could be impacted. Same problem with the telegraph communications being down, something, some stuff getting set on fire. But now you've got problems with telephone and the transatlantic cables. Those are, prob those are having problems. They're going out. There are outages. In New York City, the railroad switching failed and the burning build down. The burning, the building burned down because of the currents. They had the equipment that went on fire and it burned the building down. It turns out that ground currents aren't the same everywhere. Uh, the Earth's crust isn't the same everywhere. And so now people, at, including at the Space Weather Prediction Center, try to figure out what the crust is made of and what's the conductivity of the ground you're standing on, roughly. And it turns out that around the Great Lakes and in the East Coast and around New York, that ground, the ground conductivity is higher. So you can actually, more current can pass through these areas. So um, this, this is a problem for certain areas of the country. And they're starting to track more and more detail on that. This goes into some of the models. Here's the, here's the big storm in the space age. So now we have satellites and everything else. Nin uh, 1989, the Quebec power grid gets knocked out. There's loss of control of some of the polar satellites because that's where the particles are more coming in. There's a NASA TDRS communication has anomalies, but it didn't fail. It went offline, but it got, they got it back. The space shuttle Discovery had fuel sensor problems. They didn't know what was going on. And they realized there was a storm. And then they eventually fixed the sensor problems. Even though this storm was weaker, it caused more damage because for two reasons. Number one, we, had, we have a lot more to lose. There's a lot more stuff up there. And this, this was an interesting situation because this is three strong CMEs in a row with the last one being the strongest. So you've really sort of, you know, this, you've really aggravated the system. You keep dumping energy and then you hit it again and then you hit again really hard. So, we had 47 satellites reporting malfunctions. This one completely died, $640 million. Satellites are particularly sensitive because they're already, you already have built up charge on the surface or maybe even charged it up deep within. Then you hit it again. Then you hit it the third time, the strongest. So it's not surprising the satellites are really having a hard time. Let's switch. So that's the geomagnetic information. We really don't have much before 1859. Now, solar energetic particles are produced by CMEs. Here's someplace else to look. Gee, when are the big events? So what's the data we have? Well, we have neutron monitors on the ground since 1948, sort of reliably calibrated since 1954. This is a byproduct. You're not directly measuring the particles. But when they come crashing into the atmosphere, they produce secondary particles, of which neutrons are one of them. So you can measure them indirectly. What you love to do is have solar wind data we do start having data in 1961. But again, you're not going back very far. Here's something you do have. People have looked back 11,000 years using isotopes. Because when these things come crashing in, you can imagine they're going to create isotopes because they have so much energy that they can create carbon-14 so you can go look at tree rings. And they create beryllium-10. People dig that out of ice cores to go back that far. And one thing I haven't told you, hurricanes are bad news. But we don't worry about them in Colorado because it's not a global event. It, there's a region that's impacted. These things are global. So when these events hit, you know, it's not just, you know, France has to worry or, you know, Louisiana or something. It's, it's everything. <laughs>
the, now the poles in the higher latitudes are more susceptible, right, for the particles coming in, but these are global. Technology impacts. Well, I just put that because I'm not sure how <laughs> before the modern time to quantify that. Don't know what the technology impact was 11,000 years ago. Um, so from the beryllium record and the carbon-14, and there's a couple of people, there's a handful of people who really excel at this. They're digging through the, the, the ice cores. They're doing careful modeling of these isotopes to make sure that they think they found what's consistent, reliable information. And here's what they come up with. 775, some people call this the Charlemagne event, because he was, it was in his heyday. That is the largest event we know of in the last 11,000 years. So, so that was the big one for the solar energetic particles. And how big was it? Well, here's the largest one that has occurred where we actually can measure it. So this is the space age, 1956. And it's about a factor of 5 to 10, some people say 10, smaller than this. So that was a big one. And then here is, here's how many events occurred that were either half the size or a third of the size or a fourth the size. And when I say the size, I mean how many particles, how many isotopes were produced. It's a measure of the fluence of those particles. So you get a feel for, first of all, two things. How often do they happen? Well, they, they don't happen very often, certainly at that size. And the other thing is, you go back 11,000 years, and you kind of can say, that's the biggest one we've seen in 11,000 years. So is that your 11,000 year flood? And the reason you want to know, well, I'll get to that in a moment. There's a reason you want to know that. So here's one that missed. So how often do these things happen is a different question from how often do they hit us, right? So the Earth is a small target. And even though these are big, um, a lot of them miss. Now, by the way, some of these aren't necessarily this wide. They can appear that wide because we're seeing them projected onto a plane. It's a 3D structure. But they are wide, don't get me wrong, but they're not necessarily, you know, 180 degrees. So you have to be a little careful what we're seeing in these images. The bottom line is a, 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 an event the size of, say, this event, the July 23rd event, they happen maybe once or twice a solar cycle. So this was the biggest event of this solar cycle, and it missed us. That's good news. People then have to estimate from models, because it didn't hit us, what it would have done. And they estimate that maybe it was close to or stronger than the Carrington event would have been. So we're lucky it, it missed us. So that's Do any of those historical ones match up with, uh, I would think uh, people would have noticed um, uh, seeing a aurora borealis yeah. in France or something. Right. I, I, I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. I don't know. Some of them I know there are, but I don't know which ones. Because they do look for, um, uh, uh, in, in written records, they'll look for auroral sightings. Yeah. It's a good question. On that previous slide, we're yeah. at the 1859 event. Yeah. You have like about 30 events. Oh, yeah. So that's an interesting one that you bring that up, because that, that's coming to my last slides. The perfect storm. So because you have a big mass ejection, are you going, that's the geomagnetic storm, are you also going to get the biggest solar energetic particle event? And the answer is not necessarily. So the, 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 it, there was a particle event. They, they know that, but it wasn't one of the biggest. And by, when they say biggest, the biggest ones are really produced by the ones that also have the most uh, highest energy protons, the ones that are so revved up, they're close to the speed of light. So you, you sort of, you're measuring things in like MeV, these things in a part, you're in a particle accelerator. And we're talking stuff that's hundreds of MeV. Typical events, a big event is 30 MeV protons. That's a lot. But these big ones have really hard spectrum, like hundred, couple of hundred MeV protons. And so that particular event, the Carrington event, didn't have so much of the super high energy protons, but it did have a fair number of your 30 MeV protons. Good question. Okay, but here's your perfect storm. So, so you get hit with everything. Um, you get a direct hit from the CME and it has strong southward field that persists. That's bad news, that's the geomagnetic storm. In addition to that, the CME happens to have a really strong shock that's generating the hard spectrum. This is stuff like 100, 200 MeV protons. Fluence just means how many. And it hits us directly. Um, the flares, you know, those are always trouble, but these are bigger trouble. But yes, high intensity flares get greater than X20. And 
This one I've put in there because this one produced a lot of problems because you had three rather severe CMEs. The last one, which was pretty severe, it was, it was a big one. It was like almost 400 nanotesla negative for that DST. So it was a big one. So you've already hammered your satellites and you gave it a three, you know, one, two, three punch. So even though none of them were the, the biggest ever, they caused tons of problems because you, you had multiple events. So, yeah. They were over a couple of weeks, the Halloween storms. Okay. Yeah, yeah, less than a couple of weeks, right. Um, so what do you do? You know, you always want to leave with, well, what do we do? So let's try to answer that. So this is from, again, Space Weather Prediction Center. Rodney gave me this slide. Because they talk directly. When they see a problem, they actually will pick up the phone and call these guys if there's really a problem. Or they'll just call NASA first, and then NASA will call these guys. But this is the Halloween storms again. So in one of those storms in the 2003 Halloween, they realized they had a strong SEP event and solar flares of, it was like X-23 or X-28, I can't remember. So they called up to the space station for two reasons. One, to tell the astronauts to get into the safe regions. One of them is in the tests in, in the US lab, and one of them is in the Russian service module. And then they told them to power stuff off. So for instance, that Canadian robot arm, they turned off the power to it. So that's one way to make things safer. If you really think it's going to be something bad, you tell people to turn things off. Satellite companies don't like that if you're wrong, because that's expensive for them. But it's better than them losing their satellite. So you, you really want, you don't want to, you want to warn people carefully. You want to be sure. I mean, how does turning off help? Doesn't that induce currents? In the no, if you really turn all the power off, it does help. Okay. It does help. You know, you ever unplug your TV if your house gets hit by lightning? You have a better chance of your TV not getting blown up. <laughs> Exactly. About oh, you're, there's still, you're saying currents can run through this, but that's not the same as if you have the wi If you have this thing powered up, you will get more damage to the electronics. You could damage the electronics more. It doesn't mean you're not going to have any hits on it. I, don't get me wrong. You, you talked about the, the probability of it actually, if, if there is a big storm. Yes. What's the probability that it actually involves the Earth? Now, that's a good question. People have tried to estimate that. They think the Carrington event. One estimate was maybe that's our 500-year storm, right? <coughs> but the 1921 storm has been estimated now to be close to it, and now people are wondering, is that our 100-year flood kind of storm, right? So something like a 1921, a 19, uh, a, a, an 1859 storm could be somewhere between once every 100 years, once every 500. But, but there's so many little things at play. These things are known as low-frequency, high-impact. So it's the statistics of small numbers, right? You could have a 500-year flood if you're unlucky. Yes. You have the astronauts taking shelter. Yes. How far down in the atmosphere would people be affected by some of these? Great question. I don't worry about it. Um, if you live up in the polar regions, you're, you're probably going to get more particles, especially in that rural zone. But um, we have our atmosphere that does a heck of a good job of protecting us. And, and put it this way. You saw we have some rather severe events over the last 11,000 years. You know, the species has done fine. Maybe somebody unfortunately got a hit, and didn't know it, and got cancer, I don't know, or a mutation. I mean, that can certainly happen. But as a whole, life has been fine, we, you know. So it's tr in terms of this ending our lives, I mean, I, I would worry about it in three billion years when the sun starts to lose its helium supply and goes, you know, becomes a giant star. That would be bad news. So that's a problem for us, but I'm, it's a long ways away. I'm not going to worry about it. But, but for these things, it's really the technology. If it knocks out our power grids, we have a problem, especially if it's worldwide or large scale. That's a problem. So that's really the, that's really the problem. I wouldn't worry about that here. I mean, we have, ba we have, background, we have background uranium radiation <laughs> as well. I mean, it's just, there's, you know, there's always something. But we're well protected down here between the magnetic field and the atmosphere. So, so what do you really do to forecast? That's the Halloween storms. I can play that. Um, but here's what people are working on. It's continuing. So it's improving your forecasting, better, be getting more and better data. Um, this, again, is the Space Weather Prediction Center. And they m work closely with the science community, including us. We'd really like to have more <coughs> observations. You'd like, we get this at 1 million miles closer to the sun. 
So you can see the coronal mass ejections, but you also measure the solar wind. So if you see one of those southward pointing storms, you see it about 20 minutes before it's going to hit us. So at least you have a 20 minute warning. But if you can get more spacecraft further upstream, and unfortunately there's not a Lagrangian point there, you'd need somehow a little fleet so you're getting an upstream um, measurement, but that would be incredibly helpful. And if it's just measuring the solar wind, they're nowhere near as expensive instruments as the imagers. It but it would be great to have. Yes, Space Weather Prediction Center does most of the notifications. There is a NASA forecast center, but it's not the nation's one, and they work closely together. But Space Weather Prediction Center. And all the grids would They send, uh, they have customers everywhere. They have power grid customers, aviation, Air Force, of course, DOD. Um, yeah, believe it or not, agriculture. That one surprised me when I heard that 10 years ago. It's like agriculture, because it matters. If you can do G farm by GPS, you don't waste hardly anything for those giant farms. Yeah. Um, people are trying to work on infrastructure for the power grid. How do you make the power grid less susceptible? You don't want po a domino effect where this station goes out and there's a ripple effect. So the power grid is a little precarious. Sometimes it's too interconnected. And if one station goes out, it dumps the load elsewhere. So people are working on that. Um, and then you want to design satellites. This was the max SEP event. Well, if that's the worst we saw in 11,000 years, you certainly don't want people spending so much money to make everything rad hard. And it's not needed for anything we expect to see. So at least you can try to work with the manufacturers to say, this is sort of the probability of the radiation you're going to get hit with. And therefore, they can try to find the cost-effective solution for themselves. And then, of course, we continue partnerships. We will also work with uh, the Air Force Research Lab, uh, the forecasters, other scientists, not so much with industry and directly with airlines. But so I think that's my last slide. I'm sorry I ran over and had to keep running back and forth. No, that's great. No, yeah, that's great. thank you. I can give you a copy of everything since it's already on that data stick. And oh, great. No. Yeah. I have all kinds of questions, but I'm not going to bog down everybody. Okay. Yeah, sure. Let's we'll go around. Well, when you talk about a, a um, stuff leaving the sun with a trapped magnetic field, uh, are you talking about a loop that still goes through the sun as it travels out, or are you talking about a closed loop? traveling free somehow? That's a great question. And believe it or not, um, some of the field lines we think are still connected. They take a while to disconnect. And there's some controversy as to how much, how, what percent of the magnetic field is still connected back at the sun. Most of it gets disconnected. It does through reconnection. It's getting, it get, it's getting pulled out and it eventually will start to reconnect with other solar wind down in the corona with adjacent fields because eventually it's going to disconnect. Otherwise, you'd have this buildup of magnetic flux, and, and you'd have what's called a flux catastrophe, and we know that doesn't happen. But, but some of them take a long time, because uh, there's energetic particle of, excuse me, there's electrons that are on the field lines. In some cases, you see them traveling both ways, indicating the field line's still connected. So in some mass ejections, you see that for some percentage of the structure. It just seems to have that does not still connect to the sun. You can have that, too. You have that, though? Something you, has to be you can. maintaining that. You have to have... Well, uh, it's pressure balance. Things are trying to come back into pressure balance. So well, no, I, I mean, the right-hand rule. If you have a closed magnetic field mm -hmm. line in a closed loop, mm -hmm. then you have a current flowing. That's right. Well, it's a, it's, but that's the way electromagnetic waves are. I mean, they move that way. They have electric and magnetic fields as they as they travel in closed loops away from an antenna. And by the way, the closed clo loops. The, yes. the closed loops are, are are more of a rarity because they, when they disconnect like that too, they tend to they tend to cool off, mm -hmm. and you get these things called heat flux dropouts, and you do see them, but they're much more rare. Yeah, but these things these things will dis disconnect. Some of them will connect to the Earth's bow shock, believe it or not, or Jupiter's bow shock. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the field switch direction? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, are the CMEs more likely to be emitted in the direction of the ecliptic 
I noticed that. Oh, that's it. Then be isotropic. Yeah, no, that's a good. That's a. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, or, the answer is they tend to be well. They're where the closed structures are, and when I I showed you that eclipse image from minimum, way way back. Um, most of the structures during minimum are, are confined to lower latitudes. And so the, the CMEs are coming from where the closed structures are. I can go way back. And so at, at solar maximum, to answer your question, they can happen at all latitudes. But at solar minimum, they tend to be at the lower latitudes. So you'll have more in the ecliptic plane. Here. This is tilted. There's the pole of the sun. It's tilted with respect to the Earth's, what's called a P angle. So here's the, here's the eclipt, excuse me, the ecliptic. Here's the solar equator, right? The CMEs are coming from here. So here, here you're going to be more likely to get them at lower latitudes. But here, right at max, it could be anywhere. Good question. Another good question. You guys have great questions. When, when the Earth's magnetic field is the other way around, which it hasn't been for a well, a few hundred thousand years, but yeah. what it is, right. does that mean these uh, the, these magnetic events are adding instead of subtracting from the local field? Yeah, actually, they, they, they tend not to interact because the fields are in the same direction. But to your point, then, that means the northward pointing CMEs would be problematic. Excuse me. Oh, so We get both kinds, then. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh sure. Sure. Some of these CMEs, that's why I said, what's the perfect storm? We can get hit with a really fast CME, but it, all the fields pointing north, you'll get substorms, you'll get some kind of a storm, but you're not going to get a severe storm because the magnetic reconnection is much less likely to happen. And so the particles aren't going to get dumped into our magnetic system. And the switch? The switch? Yeah, that, that does. Yeah, throwing the switch, you want the fields oppositely directed. I mean, no, when, when the polarity during the time Oh, that's a good question. Of course, we've never, we don't have observations. So people worry about that. Does our, does our field go away? I don't, we don't think the field goes away, but it, you expect it to weaken? Yeah. Yeah. So, any, oh. oh, sorry, Dirk. Is there any uh, lasting impact to our climate from these? Oh, that's a good question. Right now, the sun, believe it or not, even after I've showed you this, most of the energy from the sun is coming from the form of radiation light. So believe it or not, if I just added up all the energy the sun produces and I include these things, they're small. It's the radiation that's producing most of the energy, right? It's where most of the energy lives is the radiation. Um, and it's incredibly constant. So, you know, it's 0.1% variability, but where it's most variable is at these very short wavelengths because of these events. At the extreme ultraviolet in X-ray, it, it can vary by factors, or, or the, even in the UV, it can vary by maybe factors of 2 to 4, and then it may be factors of 10 in the extreme ultraviolet, factors of 100 or, you know, in the, in the X-ray. Those make up such a, they're the tail, they're the tiny tail. So the, to answer your question, we think it has a very small effect on climate. The much bigger effects are the greenhouse gases, uh, volcanic activity is a big one, uh, these anomalous, that we have flows, of course, like currents, so interaction between the oceans and the, and the land currents. There's, those are the big, those are the bigger drivers. I'm not a climate scientist, but I, I know those are the much bigger drivers. We would love to be able to tell you it's the sun's fault, because maybe they send us money, but <laughs> go study it, fix it. Uh, it's not, it's not really, that doesn't mean someday it won't be. Um, not in the near future. Space weather warning system mentioned that. Yeah. Um, but can we assume that somebody for, who's uneducated on this, but who's in charge of that, would say, hell no, I'm not shutting this down. <laughs> It'll take down Wall Street or something like that. And oh. Blows up. Well, that, yeah, the people, <laughs> yeah, it, this tends to happen at a pretty high level. So, the Space Weather Prediction Center hosts a very large space weather week every year, and that's directly where industry comes, you know, the aircraft uh, companies, the um, power grid companies, you know, the government. So they're talking to each other at high levels. So if, if, if they really think a big one's about to happen, there is communication. I don't know if the local guy at the power station will throw the switch or <laughs> I don't know how that works.
<laughs> it's a good question. Um, I mean, we send out our own alerts from our data from Mauna Loa, because when we see these things, we'll send an alert to NOAA and the Air Force and some other people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you think this could affect cell phone towers? Um, I don't know. I, I, I tend to think not because um, the reason it hits the power grids is because the strong currents, they're much more susceptible to those strong ground currents that occur. It's a good question. I, I don't know the answer. Yeah, so sorry. Yeah, that's it. There's that. I guess I was thinking, are they going to go on fire or, they yeah, also, so they're a, a victim. Some people say unnecessarily on the GPS for like timing and so on. It's all throughout our economy. We're using GPS yeah. for high often just because it's there. Just yeah. it's there. There's yeah. a GPS yeah. circuit on the chip, and yeah. they don't know how to disable it, so they use yeah. it. Yeah. Well, the, the GPS doesn't go away. It's going to be inaccurate, and and it'll settle back down. The ionosphere will settle back down, and you'll get more accurate readings so again. I think the satellites are survived? Hours, depending on the severity of the storm. Could be many hours. Do you think the, the satellites will survive the, uh, the fields? The satellites? The GPS satellites, GPS satellites yeah. Um, you mean, are they themselves going to be damaged? Yes. Oh, it depends. They could be. If it's a really strong storm like that Carrington storm, I don't know, I don't know how protected they are. Uh, and also, if you're at higher altitudes, like the geostationary orbits, when you saw a picture of the Earth's magnetic field, you see that bow shock? Um, when the CME hits, it pushes in, this is us, here's our bow shock, it pushes that in. And so suddenly, the bow shock gets pushed in closer to the Earth. If you happen to be a, geomag a geostationary orbit right there, you could suddenly find yourself in the solar wind, which is really bad, because then you're getting hit with everything. Um, so that's a severe storm, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, yeah. And that was not something they were thinking of probably when they designed them, right? Um, back in the 60s and 70s, they didn't have a lot of data back then, no. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of areas that are not my most. <laughs> Right. Right. Or, or, it's, or such, but we probably need to appreciate that the environment that these space vehicles live in requires a very different design philosophy mm -hmm. than your cell phone. Yes. And you're not going to attach your cell phone to a rocket and make your own satellite. <laughs> <laughs> no, NASA has requirements for radiation. Um, thermal, it has a whole list of very specific requirements if you're in low Earth orbit, if you're in a geostationary <laughs> orbit, and if you're in deep space. Deep space is considered outside of the Earth's magnetic environment. So, yeah. And you have to, and it's a lot harder radiation, and it's at a component level, too. They'll examine things even at the component level. Uh, I did see a documentary that claimed that when uh, the Spirit and Opportunity probes yeah. got away to Mars, they were disabled. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Voyager, when it first got to Jupiter, the first one that arrived at Jupiter, there was a huge, there was a storm, and also they didn't realize how strong Jupiter's current system is. We have our own Van Allen belts. They didn't know that, and it almost killed Voyager. Uh, and it wasn't even in the worst possible place, but when it started to get into that Voyager environment, they realized they had a problem. But they, they, they managed to shut some things off, they salvaged it and went on their way, but yeah, that was the first realization of how strong the current systems were in the Jovian system. You saw our, our magnetic tail, that's why comets have that same tail, it's the solar wind pushing it all back. Jupiter is amazing, the comet, the, excuse me, the magnetic tail of Jupiter goes almost to Saturn. It is gigantic, <coughs> yeah. And, and, and we're one AU, as you know, Jupiter's five and Saturn's ten. It's gigantic. So, so, you, so but the, the sun's magnetic field fills the heliosphere, so it's got it beat, just so you know. It goes well beyond the, uh, even the Kuiper Belt objects, yeah. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of Voyager, um, that one slide that showed the Ulysses and the... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Picks up the cloud. At yeah. this point, do, well, 
are only in touch with one of the Voyagers, but yeah. do they? But actually, they, two of them. But are they, well, they don't, isn't the one, they're not really, they still get a signal, but there's a bunch coming from it? Well, one of them, you don't get as much um, plasma data. You get magnetic field from both and just a rudimentary plasma data from one. But they both have left the yeah. magnetic environment of the sun. So. Do they pick up the clouds like the other, they, have they yes. been able to? Yes. Oh, yes. There's papers in the literature on the CME seen at Voyager. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. We live in amazing times. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. You guys have such good questions. Thank you. Dirk, thank you. Without you, I'd have no presentation. <laughs>